Um, I thank God for the opportunity to do this and to allow him to speak to us through through his servant, his humble servant, that's me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a lot is going on in the world today. And um, tonight, um, a lot of times I will preach or teach, but I want to be more and more prophetic tonight because of what's taking place and try to um, bring a perspective, you know, um, God's perspective or the word's perspective on what's taking place in the world. As you know, there's a war in Israel, um, Israel against Palestine. And that war has been going on ever since the beginning of time. And um, I want to just go back in, in the word a little bit, and kind of like explain the history of that, what's taking place, why it's taking place, what's the objective, and <clears throat> to give you a sense of God's prophetic purpose and um, will in his heart in, in these world affairs. Now, if you were to listen to the news, um, I would say about 85 to 90 percent of what you hear on the news, it's slanted to towards the opposite of what God wants. And we find that increasingly a problem with the world events and the way the culture is and the way the world is today, that the, the mainstream media, the uh, primary sources of news and information is no longer reliable as we, we think it once were. And um, um, if you have two people looking at the same event and they both see different things, and they report differently. They give you their slight or their taste on the news. And, and everybody will report facts according to their own ideology and their own preconditioning. So you, you have to discern today what's the truth. I want to attempt to go back in the word. And you realize when God called Abraham out of um, his family, he called him out of a pagan nation. And he called him with his wife and his, his servants to go into a land that God has promised. Now, God promised Abraham. In Genesis 17, he cut a covenant with Abraham and he promised it to give him a land and a lineage um, and promised to be his God as an everlasting covenant. And what you understand is when God has given um, Abraham and out of the seed of Abraham, you have Israel, um, came out of Abraham, or came out of Isaac, um, which God changed Isaac's name. Um, Isaac's son Jacob was changed his name to Israel. You have um, the, the modern-day Israel today that came out of the seed of Abraham. It's a promise that God chose to bless Abraham, to bless his seed, to bless his nation and with an everlasting covenant. And the land of Canaan that God has promised Israel it's an everlasting covenant. Basically, it's it's a forever deal that is their land. So whatever you hear about, uh, whenever you hear about Israel and the land, the two-state solution and what's taking place out there, um, always know that it's God's intention, God's will, um, that Israel possess their land because God gave them that land. And it's not it's because of uh, Abraham, God gave them that land. God just chose Abraham. And God cut and covenant with Abraham, and God gave Abraham that land, um, despite who he was or what he's about or what he did. God did that all on his own. Um, he cut that covenant with Abraham. And Abraham uh, doubted the Lord. And Sarah doubted the Lord. And remember what happened? Um, Sarah brought Hagar, which was a servant girl who worked in Abraham's house, um, to as a wife to Abraham, as a surrogate, so he, Abraham could have a child with her because Sarah's womb, as the Bible said, was dried up. Sarah's, Sarah was incapable of having a child in her old age. She doubted the Lord. She brought Hagar in. Um, Abraham listened to his wife. Um, well, sometimes it's good to listen to your wife, but not when she brings another woman in the house. <laughs> she <didn't do> that. <laughs> so Abraham listened, and um, and he had a child with Hagar, and Hagar um, conceived a son and called him Ishmael. And that's modern day um, Arab and Palestinian. Uh, they 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 the, they're the they they the seed of Ish, Ishmael. They came from 
Ishmael and the tribe of Ishmael. God did bless Ishmael because Hagar cried out to the Lord and blessed that nation because of Hagar's cry. But there was a covenant made with Abraham. So I want you to think of it this way. There's one covenant. They have uh, two sons. And there's one covenant and one land, but you have two countries vying for that same land. God blessed Abraham, but he and he rejected Ishmael. Um, God blessed Isaac, sorry, and he rejected Ishmael. And I want you to understand that the two can never coexist. And God made that clear in the Bible. Not that we should just annihilate uh, the seed of, the, of uh, Ishmael. Uh, God has made provision for them. You see, I'll make them into a mighty nation. I will bless them. They have their own nation. But you have to look at it this way. When you look at eschatology, you look at the end time, you see what's, what's the end plan for uh, Islam um, as compared to the, the end plan for Christianity. That's what we're going to talk a little bit about and I'll also show you what happened. But just before we got there, I remember when um, Abraham and you have uh, Isaac and Ishmael and God wanted to test if he loved him and to see if he was a man of faith, if he would love him more than he loved his son. And Ishmael took a, a bundle of wood on his back and walked up and to a place of sacrifice. He laid himself down on the altar. And um, as Abraham was about to trust that knife into um, Isaac, remember what happened. God stopped him and said, hey, I'll provide a sacrifice. Um, now you've proven you've passed the test. We see thousands of years later on, that same place, we had a temple. And Christ came into that place and he himself took up a wood, took wood on his back and laid himself on the altar as a sacrifice and a substitutionary lamb uh, for us. So the same the same story was played out as a foreshadow as a template, a prophetic foreshadow of what was about to be fulfilled in the seed um, of Abraham called Christ, who came out of the bosom of Abraham. So we realize um, God's covenant was with Isaac. He rejected Ishmael. Um, the land was promised to Abraham, not Ishmael, um, the Arabs and the, the Palestinians. Now, what Islam, um, how that started is that a, a demonic spirit appeared to Muhammad 2,000 years after this story took place. And Muhammad, um, yes, an angel that appeared to him. And what they did is that this demonic spirit that appeared to Muhammad um, distorted the word. So they tried to, um, to, to to counterfeit the word or to, to one-up it, if you may say. So they tried to change the word by saying that the promise was not really given to uh, Isaac. The promise was given to Ishmael, that God rejected Isaac, and he extended. He gave the promise, he accepted Ishmael. God rejected Sarah and he accepted Hagar instead. You see how to twist the word. And that is not Isaac who went up to the mountain to be sacrificed. It was Ishmael, um, Islam said, that went up with Abraham to be sacrificed. That way they tried to hijack three things. The land, the lineage, and the lordship is a fight for a land, the lineage, meaning that they say it's not Isaac was given the promise, that all this stuff wasn't promised to Isaac, but rather it was promised to Ishmael. They changed the story, saying it was done with, to Ishmael in order to hijack the lineage, in order to hijack the covenant, or to change the covenant made with Ish instead of Isaac, to say Ishmael, and to declare a demonic spirit, not God, not Allah is not God, the Father, it's a, it's a demonic spirit. I want you to understand that. When they say uh, Allah Akbar, that's saying um, God is great, 
what but if you look at the uh, the 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 real definition or the real um, translation of that is is God our God is greater and so it's a hijack it's a demonic spirit now where do you get all this from if you look at who is fighting today Hamas the word Hamas it's an Arabic word it's a um, it's also a um, it's it's an acronym for the Islamic State and that's the people who are fighting predominantly they plot the terrorist attack they went in there and commit all that atrocities in Israel um they, they with violence and evil they started this whole thing um they they live on the Gaza strip which is a piece of land carved out to create uh, the Palestinian state um, on the outskirts of Israel and it's not meant to be that way it was supposed to be that way but Israel tried to give in to the international community and they wanted to have a Palestinian state so they allowed them to live there among them but from the time they allowed them to live there they've been in uh, trouble they've been a, a prick in their side basically they would say as the Bible will put it um, so if you look at Hamas, that group, uh, that that basically a bunch of terrorists they are. Um, they wouldn't stop unless Israel is completely blotted out of the the map. And the nation of Israel, they will call him the 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 small Satan, and they'll call America the big Satan. And the idea is that they want no trace of Jews or Christians left on the earth. You look at eschatology, you would see that the Islamic um, idea uh, is world domination. They wouldn't stop until the whole world, and this is their eschatology, just like our eschatology is Christ comes back, receives us to himself, and then God comes back after a thousand years and rules the world. Whatever your eschatology view is, um, the Christian way is prepositional, which is if you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you have everlasting life. Um, the the Islamic way is imposition, their, their law, Sharia law. So if you look at the eschatology of uh, Islam, it's very clear. They want to rule the world, the entire globe, rid the world of Jews and Christians, rule the world by Sharia law. That's why, if it, um, no matter who they are, if you're Muslim here, well, no, no, no harm intended, but telling you about your Muslim is not a... a I say Muslim is not a religion. It's a it's a demonic cult, um, because their god is a demon god. It's not it's not Al is not God the Father. They will try to say it's different, but it is. Different. I can prove that to you in many different ways. We don't have the time tonight, but I want to give you a little background before we move forward. So, what happens is that Islamic eschatology is that they rule the world. And to get rid of every Jew and every Christian. That's why we can't live. That's why Israel can't live peacefully with them because they won't stop attack. Put it this way: if Israel don't get rid of the Hamas and the terrorists, the, the terrorists would not stop going after them and to kill them. And if the terrorists goes after them and Israel do nothing, and the whole world is trying to condemn Israel now for fighting back. If they do nothing, it's a matter of time before they completely wipe out the Jews and then they'll come to the Christians next. And that's the natural, logical outworking of their faith. Islam is a is a religion of death. And the greatest honor in Islam is jihad, or is the is the, or the martyrdom, so that if you should take your life in the cause, no, they have no disregard for human life, while Christianity. Judeo Christianity is a religion of life. We give people to call it a religion. We'd like to say it's a relationship, but you get what I'm saying. It's about life. Islam is about death. And the highest honor in Islam is that you should take your life or you should kill yourself for the cause. And then you will be rewarded with 700 virgins in heaven. And then your family will be given an uh, inheritance. The government will give you money if your family member um, commit jihad or or fight, or die for the cause. It's all about death and destruction. And it, you can see at the heart of it is demonic. Now, this will blow your mind. The word Hamas, H-A-M-S, which is the terrorist group that just attacked Israel a week and a half ago. About 1,400 Israelis died so far. And about over 100 or more kidnapped and still left unaccounted for. 
and it's 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 the most horrific atrocities done women children elderly even holocaust survivors suffered and they did some crazy crazy stuff stuff we can't even mention here it's so horrific and it is inhumane um the word hamas is a hebrew word and it's first found in the bible and um i want to show you something that we get the root of it it's found in in genesis 6 11 i want to read this to you and this will blow your mind, but it will give you context and it will give you a revelation of what's really taking place and what's the spirit behind all this. Because no matter what happens, you have to look at it from the spirit. And this is why it's called spirit life. You can't listen to the news. You can't listen to people. A lot of people will say, well, people are suffering. I understand that. But there's a spirit behind it. There's a spirit behind Hamas. There's a spirit. If you believe the word you realize that God has given Isaac the covenant. God has promised Abraham the, the land. God has promised his lineage. And God is, will be your father, your Lord, your Lord. Islam is the opposite. They, they want to hijack and say, no, the promise is really to, it's promised to Ishmael through Abraham. Um, and it's Ish, the Ishmaelic lineage, which is uh, the Arabs, the Palestinians. And Allah is their God. So you see the way to change it around. But the word Hamas, and you want to show you this, they are not freedom fighters and they're not um, religious zealots, but it's something else and it's rooted in evil. So if you look at Genesis 6 and we're verse 11, this is in the day of Noah, Noah when God flooded the earth. This is what he said concerning the day and the people that were there. In verse 11 of Genesis 6, the Bible said, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. The earth was filled with violence. That word fill is the same word they use also for possess or um, that kind of thing. Um, so it was filled with violence. Or the translation for that, the Hebrew word is kamas. Hamas. And it's even spelled the same way. It's C H A M A S. C is also sort of silent, so it's Hamas. And that word Hamas, the, the, the definition of the word Hamas, Hamas is not only violence, but it's called it's violent evil. Violent evil. So the whole world was filled with Hamas, so violent evil. And verse 12, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupt his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, verse 13 of Hebrew, Genesis 6, verse 13, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with Hamas, or violent evil, through, through them. I'm reading the King James here. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Then he gave Noah instructions to make the ark and so forth. So you see, the whole world was, was possessed with a demonic spirit and the demonic spirit that came from Hamas. Hamas is the root. It, the whole world was possessed with demons. The whole world was possessed with violence, violent evil or Hamas. And the only thing that God could have done to save the world from that, and they were, Jesus wasn't walking around back in Noah days to cast these evil spirits out. I don't think exorcism was something that was practiced back in the day. God had to destroy every single person that was not possessed. The only people that were not possessed with this Hamas spirit, the demonic spirit, were Noah and his family. So because of that violent spirit, Hamas, um, God destroyed them. Now all of a sudden you have Hamas. It's an acronym, but it's not by chance. Because evil is very, let me tell you, it's very hard tough for evil to try to hide itself. Evil has a certain characteristic about it that for the discerning Christian, it's very apparent, it's clear, we can see it. If you put your head in the sand um, kind of way, then, then you really wouldn't see it. But it's either if you want to see light, light is there. And it's very easy, easy for you as a Christian to discern what's evil and what's not if you're honest with yourself, if you don't have an agenda. And it's clearly shown here that the spirit behind what took place a week and a half ago last Saturday, on on the day of uh, the the Sabbath was Saturday. So on the Sabbath, 
um, at this time in, in, in Israel, there would be no technology. They have their cell phones off. They'll be sleeping um, later in the day and they will just be relaxed. So no technology, no TVs on, no cell phone. And boom, you got this violent evil came in that existed way back then from Hagar. Now, this is interesting. Sarah, when Hagar came back into the house with Ishmael, Hagar had run away. She came back into the house. Um, and Sarah told Abraham, hey, you know, um, there is malice. There's, there's evil here. We have to cast it out. And the word used for Sarah when she threw out or drove Hagar out of the house is the same word used for cast out. Now, what do you do with demons? You cast them out, right? So we see that spirit that came through Ishmael and came into Abraham's house to bring tension is the same spirit that brought the atrocities that took place a week and a half in Israel. It's the same demonic spirit there. And also in this season um, of the Jewish nation, they were celebrating the joy of the Torah, it's called. The joy of the Torah. And it's a holiday. And it'll be a week-long holiday where they have this, they will just they, they, they will be events, they will give gifts. It's almost like a, a Christmas to you in Trinidad, or we call it like a Thanksgiving here, where it's just a joyous time. So in this time of joy, of the Torah, which is the word, the joy in the word, the joy because they were they, they were given the word and a festive time. The enemy came to snuff this out. The enemy came in like a thief in the night. And it's not it's interesting, he came in like a thief in the night because all the military intelligence in America or in Israel, they didn't they, they didn't even realize this was gonna happen for some reason. And it's not by chance a thief in the night. It came in and they, they destroyed so many lives and tried to steal the joy from this holy day, a holiday. Why do we call it a holiday? Because it's supposed to be a holy day. And the Sabbath, the Sabbath was a holy day. The enemy came in on that holy day and tried to turn that holy day, which is a Sabbath, a rest for the children of God, of the Lord, and the, this, the week-long celebration of the joy of the Torah to try to change a holy day into a non-holy day filled with carnage and blood and memories. So that in the mind of the people who lost loved ones, who saw the carnage and saw the horrific things done to babies and elderly and families and women, it creates trauma every year that the holiday comes around or on the Sabbath day. So you see the enemy here is he came in at the same time in order to take the joy away from the word because when you read the word you rejoice the, the the word produces joy it produces hope it produces peace the enemy came in to sabotage that no this is the next the next revelation or not the revelation but the next truth behind all this when you see in the natural a war like this and it's a prophetic war now even before we get there on the night that that happened it was a sunday it was a a, a lunar uh, eclipse, you call it. It was a ring of fire. Now, on Christian churches, you will see a cross on top of the church. Most Christian churches in America have a cross on top because we worship God through Jesus Christ, who bled and died on that cross. That was a love of the Father demonstrated on that cross. Now, on on is on on mosques, you know, we see the crescent, and it's not the same day that they they came in. The, the Islamic State came in, or that spirit of Hamas. It's called a ring of fire, lunar eclipse. That same day, or I think it was the next day, you had a, a sign in the heavens because of what took place on the earth where the, the crescent was on fire. And you had the whole Middle East, and the crescent represents the Islamic or the Ishmael, uh, the seed of Ishmael. You saw it in the Middle East, it's on fire. And now Palestine, Palestine is paying a severe price because of what they've done. So whatever takes place on earth, you see the sign in heaven. It's prophetic. Wherever there is war in the natural, there is a greater war in the spirit. I want you to understand that. Whenever you see a war in the natural, and you see what's taking place here in Israel, you realize Israel is God's stopwatch. People call it Israel is God's illustration of what's taking place 
spiritually when it comes to his will and plans for the earth. So if you want to know what God is doing on the earth today, what God is doing in Christendom, if you were to call it, you look at Israel and see what's going on. And it gives you an illustration because God has given that to us as a practical uh, sign of what's taking place. So we can't, we wouldn't lose sight of his plan and his purposes in his season. And you see right now, Israel is going through a war and they're being attacked. What that says to each and every one of us is that the enemy right now, the season in your life, the enemy is after you. Now, I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm saying this because of what we see and we would be ignorant to not discern, ignorant to not realize that the enemy is trying to come up against the anoint God's anointed in order to steal their joy. So prophetically, I'm telling you today that the enemy is your joy. Now, you knew this, but all of a sudden we see manifest in the natural. We see all the signs. We see the demonic spirit behind it. And we realize there's something more than just what we see in the natural here. So the true of God has been attacked everywhere all over the world. The enemy has amped up his attack. He's coming against you in, in a couple different ways. Number one, to cause, to steal your joy. He wants to take your joy away because if the joy of the world is your strength. If he steals your joy, then what happens? You lose your, your strength. You lose, you lose your, your motivation. You lose your zeal. And all these things are necessary because of what's taking place on the earth. You can get discouraged very easily without zeal, without having the motivation to move forward. So don't fall for the trickery. Now it's time to do the opposite. Now it's time to be zealous for the Lord. Now it's time to step up. Basically put actions to the word until you feel it. Put actions to the word until you feel it. Don't try to feel it, then put actions to the word. You get what I'm saying? Don't try to feel it first. Don't try to feel motivated, then move. No, move according to the faith that you have and the trust that you have in the word. And then the feeling will come afterwards. Most Christians most Christians wait to feel it until they do it. No, just do it because it's true. Do it because God says to do it. Do it because the word says to do it. And joy will come. Because it's very easy to get discouraged in this time. It's very easy for you to, to sort of fall off the bandwagon. Now, momentum is key to victory. So even if you something happens in your life now that sort of like slowed you down or you, you kind of like you lost momentum in moving forward because we always have to be constantly moving forward. Just get right back up and go on again. Don't take too long before you get back up and start just running full speed ahead because we have to keep that momentum and that momentum will cause you to be focused that momentum will cause you to not fall for the trickery of the enemy that momentum will also um, save you from going through similar experiences or attacks of the enemy now also the same way israel has to be on alert or be sober minded the the word for us tonight is so that we can remain vigilant and sober minded and a lot of times the enemy can't get to you because he can't make you doubt the word, but he will get try to get to you through the people around you or through situations. He will try to bring you back down from heavenly places and attach you to a problem or attach you to a person's perspective of you or attach you to a specific natural or earthly issue. You have to see that, discern that, realize that the enemy trying to bring me back down to earth level. No, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We exist in a place of victory. We exist in a place of the, being an overcomer, having more than enough, no lack, full of joy, full of peace, full of hope, full of faith, right? Um, we are a positive influence. We are a positive peer pressure. We are a positive flow, a positive force. We are optimistic because we have a hope in Christ. Wherever we go, Sick gets healed, the demons are cast out, right? The dead rape. That that's who we are as a people because Christ paid a severe, expensive, expensive um price. He paid daily to afford us that authority it, it, to do these things, to be that kind of people. So because we are that kind of people, we have to remain in a heavenly place that offers us all those benefits 
and not allow in this season of your life, not allow anything to pull you back down. Not allow anything to pull you back down because that's what's taking place right now. We know this has been coming for a while. Um, I sensed it. I think that's why we even read Ezekiel uh, 9 where we talked about intercession and praying against the evil, the atrocities, and also people that were marked. If you were upset about what's taking place in the world and the culture, that you saw what happened in Ezekiel, that you were marked and protected from when uh, evil came. And, um, and one of the ways to stay protected is to cry out on behalf of the children of Israel. One of the promises God gave to Abraham or to Israel, and is that if you should bless them, he would bless you. And if you should pray for Israel, then God will answer your prayer. That's how it's a trade-off. If you want to pray for others, you will be healed. But you pray for Israel, it's one of the, the other ways, or the number one way, of, of you yourself being blessed. If you want to be blessed, pray for Israel. Let's put it that way. Pray that God will protect his his. his his covenant, his children, the lineage. Um, Christ came out of Israel. And because of that, th that tribe is blessed. That nation is blessed. Now, God handpicked Israel to show the whole world um, what would how a nation will be and benefit should they make him their God and their Lord. And God had to do that because we're natural beings. We had to see, okay, if they if you if you obey God, you're blessed. If you honor God, he will bless you, he would prosper you. If you disobey God, he would basically nothing would go good in your life, basically. And that's what he did through Israel to show us that the seed came through Israel. Uh, the, the promise made to Abraham was that his seed will bless the whole earth. And it's, it's a singular seed. If you read the covenant that God um for Abraham in Genesis 17, and speaking about Christ, Christ is that seed that will bless the whole world, whole earth that came through in Judah or oh, um which is a tribe of, um, that came through the, 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 the bosom of Abraham. So it is war in the earth. There is war against the children of Christ. And what do we do in this situation? <laughs> How, what do we do with that? I want to read you some verses. So what do we do as children of God in this season? Now, remember, the enemy can be everywhere at the same time. But what he is doing now is that he's amped up. He's against the children of God. He's trying to steal their joy. He's trying to sabotage their faith. He's trying to take away the joy of the word from you. So the number one thing we do is read the word. Read your Psalms 23. I love reading the through the Psalms. Pray, read the Psalm every day, now more than ever, because the enemy is trying to take away the joy from the word. You do the opposite. That's how you fight the enemy, by doing the opposite. The opposite is to read the word. So you take the word, just don't read it in your mind. Take that word and you read it out loud in your house. So whatever familial spirit, whatever demonic spirit, whatever demonic attachment, whatever spirit of sabotage is connected to your family, is connected to your lineage, is connected to generations before you that feel they have and think they have an open door to your family and yourself and try that word. There's like a double-edged sword that will what? Destroy the curse, the word of the enemy over you and will allow for the word of God to prosper and to manifest in your life and in your family. So read the word. I want you to write that down if you have to write it or remember it. I'm giving you tools here to fight back. So basically, if you think of yourself as Israel, Israel, um, Israel lost 1,500 people, well, 1,500 Fourteen, fifteen hundred. 1500. Um, Israel is a state with only eight, I think it's eight million, eight point something million. Trinidad is like 1.4, I think, million people in Trinidad. Um, so think of it. If, Trin if Trin that's equivalent to about, say, about 8,000 people dying in, in, in a couple, in one day or so, two days in Trinidad, that, that's a huge hit. That's equivalent to what took place in Israel. And that's huge. That's the, so. If you think of yourself as going through what they went through, um, well, how do you fight back? How do you fight back? One of the things that Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, is doing with the children of Israel, um, or the people of Israel, actually the children of Israel. Yeah, they are children of Israel. 
citizens of Israel is that he's given them guns so that when people come, they'll have a, they'll be armed. Um, one of the way that we arm ourselves is with the word. You have to read that word and get that word out there out loud. Now the word should be in your heart, yes, but when you read the word, it what is it's almost like putting the it's putting the uh the, the blood on the lentil so that the death angel will go over. It's on, that word is, is bringing God back into the situation. It's bringing his protection. His, God is honors the word above himself, his name. Sorry. The word is important. So when you read, it's important you read that word and that because demons are legalists. And if you are not speaking that word, reading that word, they like to pretend that word don't exist. And uh, God created this way. That's why God commanded the children of Israel to speak that word, recite the word, meditate on the word, write the words on their, their doorposts, write it on little pieces of paper. It's all about the because that word protects. That word that was a natural example of the spiritual efficacy of the word and how potent that word is. I would say read Psalms 91, read Psalms 27, read Psalms 23. Read Psalms 119. I love all the Psalms because they, they go against what the enemy is trying in your life. So we are in a war. I want you to know that. And that's why you have to be vigilant and say so read the word. Number two, you pray. You pray and cover your family with the blood of Jesus Christ. Cover them with the blood. Um, release angelic protection over your home. And pray strategically over yourself and your family this time for divine protection. So number one, read, pray for divine protection. Divine protection. Okay. Now I want to read you some um, some verses here that will encourage you in this time. One second. Let me get it right here. Okay, a couple of verses. We'll see where the Holy Spirit will take us with this. How do we prepare for war? How do we arm ourselves so we can fight against the enemy? Mind you, not all the time we fight, um, but now we have to. <laughs> um, sometimes we just lay back. The whole Lord is fighting all battles for us cooperation and fight in this battle just because of the it's 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 open war against the children of god and it, it's it's in all areas hold on a second second there's so much war i can't even get my thing open here okay i got it about where is it one second the verses in the Bible. Well. Okay. Bob Sam first Peter five eight. Um, First Peter five eight: Be sober minded, be watchful. The adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And that word can't be more true than now. Now, I don't want you to be so uh, preoccupied with what the enemy is doing that it sabotages your 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 spiritual walk. Is that what I mean by that? Is that the normal Christian life is that we always remain preoccupied with what the Father is saying, what the Father is doing, with our mindset on things above, our eyes are set on Jesus. The Lord will protect us, the Lord will keep us, the Lord will fight our battles for us. That's a normal Christian life. But there are times, when the Bible says he trains your, 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 fing your, your fingers to fight and your arms to war. 
Um, you yeah, you're almost to war on your fingers to fight, basically. Um, there are times when we have to fight against the enemy. There are times we have to war against the enemy. There are times we have to go to Jericho. You can't always stay at Bethel. Bethel is where you receive dreams and visions and prophetic, and God is changing, change Abraham's name to Abraham. Um, it's it's you, you can't always be at at um at the Jordan where the apostle becomes possible. There are times you got to go Jericho, and uh, Jericho is warfare because there's there's something to do. There's a place to go, and you have to get through in order to get to the other side. And that's what the enemy is doing now. He's trying to sabotage us from taking that next step. He's trying to prevent God's perfect will in this time and this season. Because you could basically say, and every generation has said this after Jesus, they're in the end times. And we could say we're in the end times. Because we look at what's happened with Israel. We see this God's stopwatch. It's basically a, the, 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 the watch has started. And it's a countdown. And it's good versus evil. You see the spirit of Hamas is back in the land. Now, they've been there, but now we see they have a head, they have a name. And the Bible said the last days will be as the days of Noah. Remember that. That same spirit again is here and has popped his head and is causing carnage on the earth. Now, the whole Middle East, even in America here, you have kids who support um, Hamas. And, and not knowing there's a spirit behind it. You see, they're blind to the spirit. Behind it. It's a demonic spirit that was here. The people are gone, but the spirit is still here. And different people working through a different generation. You understand? It's a demonic spirit that propels Islam. You see, Islam is not a religion, too. It's, it's, it's a law. You can't separate church and state in Islam. Islam. Is Sharia law. Even in some cities in America and Europe, you have when Muslim immigrants come in, they they change the law of that place that even the police are not allowed to go in because it's Sharia law. It's, it's, it's a lifestyle. It's a law. It's a system, but it's a demonic system. And they worship a demonic God. They don't worship the true God. You have to remember that. You can't, there's no moral equivalence to Islam and Christianity. You might say, well, they do good things. Or you might say they are sincere and they are nice people. Yes, they're sincere. They do good things. They're nice people, but they're sincerely wrong. You could be sincere and you could be honest, but you could be sincerely wrong and go to hell at the same time too. Remember that. You see, all people are equal, but not all ideas are equal. Only one is true. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. And these distinctions had to be made so you wouldn't fall for the trickery of the enemy to use sincere good people to trick you to come over on their side. If you're weak, you will come over on their side, but it's a different spirit at work. And when you understand that, you don't judge a thing by the natural. You judge it by the spirit. And it's a demon. So um, going back to the word real quick, the Bible said, um, be sober-minded, be watchful, for your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Sober-minded means that you are aware of what's taking place in this time. That's why those who are not on this this um this study, a lot of times, they, they may see what's going on down there. They may go about their business not realizing you have to look, you have to be sober-minded, you have to pay attention. What is God saying? What is happening in the world? We can't be so ignorant to not know what's taking place so we can do what's necessary to protect ourselves, to protect ourselves from the wiles of the enemy. Yes, God protects us, yes. But if we are not vigilant, if we're not sober-minded, be watchful of us. If we're not watchful, then guess what? That the roaring lion could find a weakness in our defense and he could try to sabotage because this is the season he is looking for a weakness in your defense. So that's why we stay prayerful. We stay watchful. Amen. Uh, the Bible says also in um, Ephesians 6 and verse 12, uh, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers and darkness, against just spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So it's a spiritual, not a physical war. What you see in the physical is only a manifestation. 
of what's already taking place in the spirit. I'll say it again. What you see in the physical is a manifestation of what's already taking place in the spirit. So the enemy is, has ramped up his, his war, his efforts to try to destroy the children of God. Now, the sense that we're getting today too, and I haven't heard a lot of people say anything about this. I don't really listen to a lot. I want to hear from the Lord first. Is that the enemy... At one time, I thought he would toy with Christians. He would mess with them, mess with their friends, mess with their finances, mess with their families. And he would just try to steal your joy in a sense. But now the sense that I'm getting and what I'm realizing is that he's out for blood. He wants to destroy you, not just to take from you. Yeah, he's a steal, kill, and destroy. He done a lot of stealing, but now he's killing and destroying. So... What you think you've gotten away with before, um, I think now it's it's hard to get away with because the enemy once he finds a foothold, he's not he doesn't want to leave and he wants to destroy you before he leaves. That's why we have to be vigilant. That's why we have to be sober minded. That's why we have to call prayer meetings. That's why we have to fast and pray and do all the things necessary to not only keep ourselves in the bosom of the Father or stay hidden in Christ so the enemy can't find us, but we can remain minded. That means our mind is open to what the Spirit is saying as to what to do in this time so we can not fall into a ditch or fall into a bad place or be attacked by the enemy in that sense. Now, so it's a spiritual battle. Um, let me read you another verse here what the Lord will try to say. Um, Psalms 91, 1 to 16. Psalms 91 is an awesome verse. Bob said, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. So there's a precursor. There's something that happens before you get all this benefit. God said, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow. And what does it mean to dwell? It means to abide. It means to dwell. It means to live in his presence. But what am I saying here? To live in his presence. Basically, we have to begin one of a, a weapon of war, a weapon not so much a weapon, one of the surest ways to stay protected and and to stay free from the attacks of the enemy is to dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, is there a physical house that we can dwell in that we stay protected from the enemy? No, it's it, it's a physical house is like church. There's a spiritual house. He lives, he's templed in us. And as we dwell in his presence, as we dwell, that word dwell means to remain, to, to build a home in it, basically. If we stay in his presence is one of the surest way where you are free from attacks of the enemy because the enemy can't come too close to the presence of God. And how do you stay in his presence? It means have an attitude of worship. An attitude of worship will always bring heaven on earth, will cause you to stay in a heavenly presence and aura around you all the time, an attitude of worship. So if you're not a worshiper, now is the best time to become one. If you're not a worshiper, now is the best time to practice worshiping. What do I mean by worship? Worshiping is not singing songs. Worship is basically lavishing your affections towards heaven. Lavishing your affection towards the sun. The object of your worship is Jesus. You look at Revelation, you see Jesus is the object of our worship. Even in eternity, Jesus will be receiving our worship. When we worship the Son, the Father receives the glory. Understand that? We worship the Son, Jesus Christ, the Father receives it. So you look to Jesus and you worship him. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. You are worthy, Jesus. Thank you for what you did, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you don't know how to worship, let's say hallelujah a thousand times. <laughs> if you don't know, that's the shortest way because hallelujah is the, the highest form of worship, they would say. Just say hallelujah. Hallelujah. So practice that all day. Because if you stay in his presence, that will ensure that you're in his presence, that you're close to him. He that, he that dwell in the shelter of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And then you can say, 
The Lord is my refuge and my fortress and God I will trust. He would deliver me from the snare of the fowler. So worship is one of the surest ways to stay in his presence. Not only worship is a physical thing you do because you want to speak, you want to acknowledge, you want to imagine, you want, but being, the second thing is be aware. Practice your awareness of his presence. Here's a song, um, Holy Spirit song, Lord help me. Um, let us be more aware of your presence. Remember that bridge in that song? Let us be more aware of your presence. What does that mean? It means practice your awareness of him. It means stop and just think think of him. Say, thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence. Because remember, you're dead and hidden in Christ. If I'm dead and hidden in Christ, then why is the enemy? The enemy can't find me. I want to stay dead and hidden. So the, the, the idea I have in my mind, when I'm about to say I'm dead and hidden in Christ, it hidden means hidden. It means the enemy can't find me. In Christ means, it's almost like Christ, uh, there's, there's a, Christ is like a suit that zips up, almost like a kangaroo with a pouch, you know? But a suit that zips up, then I tuck myself in there and zip it up. So the enemy is looking for me. He can't find me. He sees Christ. So if I'm dead and hidden in Christ, he can't find me. So be aware. Practice the awareness of where you are and who he is. Where am I? I am dead and hidden in Christ. The enemy can't find me. He can't sniff me out. The, because I'm in, I'm in Christ. I'm dead and hidden in Christ. I can't be found. And as long as I stay dead and hidden in Christ, he can't find me. But at the same time, I am in the shelter. I am under his wings. And you begin to imagine and be aware of where you are. I'm under his wings and protected. And Psalm 91 said that you're under his wings. You get what I'm saying here? So practice the attitude of worship. Practice the awareness of where you are, okay, in him. I'm under his wings. I'm covered for he would deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions. And under his wings, you will find refuge. His, faithful, his faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You would not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day. So worship the awareness of where you are, okay? At that, that, that given time. And the power of the blood. The third thing. The power of the blood. The blood of Jesus Christ is powerful. Now, I want to share with you. Maybe I share with you. I shared this before. But I'll share it with you again um, as a dream. Now, I'm the, I'm involved in a lot of deliverance ministry out here in the United States. Um, people who are demon-possessed. People who have been traumatized. Um, demonized. Um familiar spirit the witchcraft and different things like that i do a lot of deliverance and i remember when i started early on very years and years and years ago um i realized that there's there's something i need to to give the people to use against the enemy i need a weapon i need something that people who just came into the faith you know, where the enemy is trying to take them out and what what can they say what can they do and i got a dream and I don't, I'm not sure if I shared this with you before, but forgive me if I did. But it's something that changed the way I fought, I fought the enemy. It's one of the, the one of the the, the uh, tools that the Lord gave me in a dream. Now the Lord speaks to me in dreams all the time. Um, ever since I was really young, the Lord will give me really clear dreams that will give me prophetic direction and give me um, revelation and give me strategies. Now this was a tool that the Lord gave me to fight the enemy. So in this dream, it was clear. I can remember the, the time. I can remember, it's almost like I feel it. There's one of those, you know, when God gives you a dream, you know it's so real. It's almost like you you know you were there. Um, I dreamt that I was in the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus was right next to me. I was, and he was uh, kneeling next to a huge rock. Uh, maybe some of those, artistic paintings that you find artist paintings of jesus um, at gethsemane you'll see him kneeling, kneeling at a rock and it was similar to that he was kneeling at a rock and and jesus looked up because i was standing up and he looked up at me and we didn't use words but it's almost like i knew what he was saying without words he looked up to me and what i perceived he said is that to say to say to speak out loud to say the blood of Christ, the blood of Jesus is against you. The blood 
of Jesus, these exact words, the blood of Jesus is against you. So he was there, and you can see that he was he was sweating blood. You can see the strains, perspiring blood, basically. And he looked up to me with almost like sorrow in his eyes, but he would say, say the blood of Jesus is against you. So he was sharing his, shedding his blood, but he wanted me to use the blood and say the blood of Jesus is against you. Now, when I looked away from him in the opposite direction, on the horizon, there was just black, like an army, an army of people, but it was just black on the horizon. As far as your eyes can see, there was a line in front of horizon one, where it was the front uh, of the army, but it was the army of hell. Now, I didn't know this because in the dream, I just knew in my spirit was the army of hell. Basically, I had all this information in there without anyone telling me. It's, it's instant, inst instant information, basically, um, in the dream. So the army of hell is marching towards where Jesus and where I was standing, and they were, they were advancing. And at the front of the army, you had uh, a commander. And I realized he was a commander because in the dream, um, I just knew he was a commander, and he was called the Beast. And he had um, a head like a, a bull, and the rest of his body was a man, but he was he was tall and strong and big muscles, but he was a beast. And he was using every foul word you can ever consider or hear about. He was using and hurling it against where I was standing right next to Jesus, and he was advancing on Jesus. Maybe that was a vision of what Jesus actually went through that night interceding for us, interceding for what he had to do on that cross, and all the armies of hell was, was against him. But the beast, the person who was at the front of the army, who was leading that army, he was the number two in hell. How do I know that? Just spiritual information in the dream. He was number two in hell, and he was advancing. And then, for the first time, I used the words, the blood of Jesus is against you. The blood of Jesus is against you. I said it once, nothing happened. I looked at Jesus again, and he said, say it again. The blood of Jesus is against you. And I looked at the army. I looked away from Jesus and I looked at the army and said, the blood of Jesus is against you. And then for the third time, Jesus said, say it again. And this time I said it louder. I said, the blood of Jesus is against you. And they had advanced a little bit way to, between the third time I said, the blood of Jesus is against you. And a little bit closer, I could see the face on the beast, the third, the commander of, of, of hell's army. And all of a sudden, the third time I said that, he he didn't stop, but they began to move in slow motion, like there was an invisible wall of, of quicksand was, that was clear. You could, but it was like almost like gel, and they begin to like struggle to move forward. Now all this time he was cursing, they were advancing. I said the blood juice against you. The third time, he was. Then I said it a fourth time, and all of a sudden they stopped. They couldn't advance anymore, and they stopped there. When I said the blood of Jesus grants you, and I I couldn't even hear them after that too as well. Um, it just all of it just stopped, and I woke up that morning realizing that, and I never when I prayed will say the blood of Jesus is against you, and it was just words given from Jesus to me. To fight the enemy, to stop the enemy, and ever since that day, the people that I counsel are one I'm praying against the armies of hell, like the, the the worst of the worst, can come up against you by saying the blood of Jesus against you. Understand that He shed the blood to give us the authority and the right to say that. With that understanding, it works every time. So if there is apparent evil, you know the hordes of hell are against you. You know there's some situation. You know the, the demonic thing at the core of it. It's safe to pray and say the blood of Jesus is against you. But because it's sabot it stops him from advancing on your cause. Amen? And that's a strategy um, that works. So understanding the power of the blood. The power of the blood. Because Jesus shed his blood. He paid the price to give us the authority to do that thing. Let me give you a verse before I leave. And this will help um, back that up a little bit. It's in Luke 10, 19. And I'm going to read it from the King James Version. Luke 10, 
Hallelujah. Now, this was uh, the preceding verses here. Uh, what took place in Luke 10 is when Jesus sent out the 70 to do uh, ministry, and they came back rejoicing, saying that verse 17 said to the Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through the name. And verse 18, the Lord said, I beheld Satan as light that fell from heaven. Verse 19 here is what we want to look at. Jesus is saying this to everyone. Now, this is not just his disciples. This was 70 other people he sent out, 70, 70, to go out and do the works of Christ. And Greg called and told to do the same thing. Um, verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I'll read it again. Behold, I have given you power. The word there, power, in the Greek is the two word used for Greek interchangeably. One is dunamis. If you look in any Greek translation of the New Testament, a lot of times they use the word power. The translation is dunamis. Dunamis is that power translated in English. Oh, it's translated exosia. And exosia means authority. Dunamis means power, dynamic, like force. So you have authority and you have force. I, I always say the difference between authority and force or the difference between exosia and dunamis is that dunamis is like the gun and uh, the, the the policeman has in his in his in his, his waist, you know, his holder, holster, or exosia is like the badge and the uniform he wears. So exosia gives him the authority to use the dunamis, which is the gun. So exosia is the authority, okay, and that gives him the badge and the uniform. That gives him the 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 badge and the uniform gives him the exosia, the authority. To use the gun, which is a dunamis. The Bible said here, Behold, I've given you exosia. You say I've given you power. The word here is exosia. Basically, it's authority. I have given you the authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And over all. Now, the word is all. There's no Hebrew word for that. There's a Hebrew word, yeah, but it's, it's past. It means all. It means whole. It means every. It means whatsoever. I've given you the authority. So Jesus is saying this. This is the red words here in the New Testament. Behold, I give unto you exosia. I give you the badge and I give you the uniform. The tr I give you the authority. And how do we get that authority? You get that authority just by being connected to God through Jesus Christ, which is salvation. So true salvation, we get the authority. This is like this is what the Bible said. These are the signs that will follow those who believe. They'll cast out demons, they'll heal the sick, and they'll pick up any deadly thing. It wouldn't hurt them. You get what I'm saying? The authority is given. You don't have to work for that because it's given to you through salvation. So you work for the heavenly kingdom. You have the badge and you have the uniform of heaven to implement God's authority on the earth over the enemy. So Christ di died and purchase our ability to walk in his authority, the same authority that he exuded over the enemy. The reason why the Son of God was manifested was to destroy the works of the enemy. The Bible said that the Son of God was manifested, and he was successful. So what does that mean? So it means all the works of the enemy. That's what the Bible said here. All, all the works of the enemy, all the works of the enemy have been destroyed over us. Once we are connected to Christ through salvation, which we all have saved, been saved, and we are saved in this room. So that means automatically you have the authority to do this. To tread upon serpents and scorpions. That's demonic spirits. They earthbound serpents and scorpions. And over all the power, all the power, and that word power is dunamis, all the might of the enemy. You have authority all you've given a badge and a uniform to exert what? To have authority over all the power, no matter what the enemy tries. When it comes to his might and his his power and his dunamis, no matter what he does and his dunamis, guess what? Dunamis, doom, doom, dunamis, sorry, you have the power to overcome. And he's given because Christ has given you power over all the enemy. And nothing, and this is a promise, nothing 
shall by any means hurt you. It means not, I guarantee, he said guarantee to, but nothing will hurt you. You may say, well, some Christians get hurt. Yeah, well, hurt will come. Uh, you may say, well, what happens? But I'm telling you here, he has given us the authority over every might of the enemy, over every weapon of the enemy, over every dunamis, over every kind of gun, whatever caliber the enemy use against you. You have authority over that. You can condemn it with your words. You can condemn it with what? Saying the blood of Jesus Christ is against you. So it's like a policeman standing up there with his badge in the middle of the street. And he tells the semi-truck, big truck, stop. He has to stop because why? He has a badge and he has uniform on it. The driver will see that badge and uniform on it. He would stop. So... Think of it, even if the devil comes to you as an army, he comes to you as a Mack truck, you can say, stop, the blood of Christ is against you. And that's how you can defeat his devices. You can defeat the enemy. But you have to exert your influence. If a cop stays, if a policeman stays hidden or stays in his car, he can't stop that, sem that semi-truck. But the second he walks out there in the middle of the street and they recognize the uniform, they recognize the badge, they realize they will stop. The enemy has to stop when you exert your authority. You understand that? But if you refuse to exert your authority, he will just drive around you. If the police the fan say, if he doesn't say stop, and he just stands here on the side of the road, and not in the middle of it, stopping the enemy, he will just keep on driving. He will stop. But the second you exert your authority, and the authority is through the blood of Christ, he has no choice. You have all power over all the vices of the enemy. So what I want you to do this time is be encouraged. Even though the enemy comes up against you, we have been given all authority. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Stay prayed up, stay watchful, stay sober-minded, stay vigilant. Only be aware that the enemy is trying something, but be more aware of his presence because that's where you find protection. That's where you find protection. There's no reason to panic no reason to fear you would not fear the pestilence but the hours by day or the pestilence by night you wouldn't fear because there's no, there's no reason to christ died to give us the authority over every device of the enemy so what you see in the natural you have to realize it's taking place in the spirit and it's against god's children the same way the enemy's fighting god's children the demonic spirit that was here in the times of noah that got destroyed. The people are gone, but that same spirit is here today. And how do you know it's the end time? As in the days of, the, the, the last days will be as the days of Noah. And you, all of a sudden you see this snake, Hamas, this violent, evil spirit that works through a religion called Islam that's trying to dominate the world through evil and try to hijack the lineage, the promise, the covenant, to steal the land and to bring about violent evil, because that's the word, violent evil and destruction. Um, it has to be stamped out, only to be stamped out through prayer and pushback. Pushback is mean the children of God exercising their authority over the works of the enemy. So be encouraged and realize that Christ has already afforded us the victory. And we are victorious and more than, more than overcome us through Jesus Christ. Amen. And pray for Israel. Bishop. Thank you, Bishop Pastor Ryan. No, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It just 